and welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. I'm Kevin. And this is episode 51. And Kevin, we got a listener question. We have a listener? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think we actually have several because they comment on Twitter and stuff. But this one listened all the way to the end of our last episode where I mentioned you can go to the website and ask a question and fill out the form. And they totally did that. We think you're awesome. Yeah. So so Heidi sent us a question. So we want to actually Heidi. answer that question. Not my sister. I actually Heidi. have a sister named Heidi. Welcome, Heidi. I, don't, I, th- I hope you're listening again. Yeah. I, I have a brother, I think, who listens to the podcast. He's never sent us a question. Your brother's name is Heidi? No, my sister's name is Heidi. But this isn't my sister. Okay. Well... Keep up, Kevin. Hello, Heidi. Keep- and, and Peter's brother, who is not named Heidi. <laughs> He's very glad of that, probably. That he's your brother, that he's not named Heidi. That he's not named Heidi. The brother part is still to be determined. Yeah. Anyways, so it's great because this this question is perfectly in line with our series on Christology because it's a question about Jesus. And so we definitely want to handle this today. So you, but we're going to do it the crucial conversations way, right? Backwards. (laughs) I kind of think, yeah, we're, we're going to back our way into this like probably. we often do. Yes, probably. Um, so before we get too far, those of you who are listening, you can ask us questions. And as you'll see, we do want to answer your questions. Be so, like Heidi. Yeah, be like Heidi. <laughs> this should be, that be, I'm not going to title the episode that. That's not a good... You could try I, it. I could, yeah. Um, questions at crucialproductions.org is the email address you can send them in there or like Heidi did go to our website crucialproductions.org and at the very top there's a ask a question link and just fill out the form and send in a question that way the website also has everything else under the sun that we produce not everything under the sun just that we produce oh, you, oh I, yeah you were a little, That's little a bit shocked clause because you know wow <laughs> I, I was careful to qualify it so we mentioned last week, Kevin has the Sunday morning Bible study at his church that he teaches. We've got this podcast. We've got Romans and Five out. And maybe I'm kind of thinking that I might want to release Habakkuk this week. Cool. What do you think? Habakkuk and Five, maybe around Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving. Yeah, because there is like a psalm of Thanksgiving end, and praise at the end. Thanksgiving end. thing, yeah. So that might be fitting for this week. We'll, we'll see how that works out. And we're coming at the end of the year. If you appreciate what we do if you like what we're doing here and want to support it financially go to crucialproductions.org slash give you can do that we are incorporated as a nonprofit. but kevin what do we want them to do first give to your church first yeah and and even if you don't appreciate what we're doing and you still want to give that's fine too (laughs) you know what i like that yeah (laughs) yeah we don't mind anybody yeah it doesn't matter who you are but give to your church first and um you know buy your kids something for christmas do you know what's cool I don't I know do. if I told you this. My 12-year-old son gave to us. That is so cool. Yeah, he has a little part-time job mowing lawns. Yeah. And he had his tithe from it. And just like we said here, he wanted to give to Crucial. He actually wanted to give all of it to us. I was yeah. like, wait, wait, hold on. That's a wonderful... Yeah, that's really cool. You know, motivation, yeah. impetus. But tithe first. Right. And then give a portion of it Very to nice. Crucial. So he Very gave nice. us $4. That's awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. That is so cool. So he's actually in our database as a donor now. That is fantastic. Gave us four dollars. It was awesome. So I don't have any sons. Your daughter. You got a couple daughters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but they're poor college students. They are they? poor college yeah. students. So yeah. Anyways, we can talk about that later. But anyways, any anything helps. Yeah. Like I said, it's and it's just awesome to see my son. Like, Dad, I like what you're doing. How can I support it? And there you go. He did. Yep. <laughs> but really, the coolest way you can support it is by. Um, Reading the scriptures. Yeah. And going to church on Sunday. Yep. Find your local LCMS church and go <laughs> every week. Speaking of reading your scriptures, mm-hmm. we had a guy comment on our Romans in 5 video. Yeah, we did. And he had some questions. Yeah. A couple comments. He had some yeah. questions, some long questions. Interesting questions. And But what I thought was cool was he's reading Romans. Yeah. Which so is it's like kind of the point. He didn't necessarily agree with everything we said. The whole everything in the video had some questions about it. But I was reading his response. I'm like, but you're reading Romans. Yeah. And that's even better than that's anything else. So cool. if you watch this video and you went and read your Bible, if you listen to this podcast, and as a result of what we talk about, you open up your Bible and say, Is that what it actually says? Well, that's what we want you to do. That's the point. That's great. Now, we're five minutes of the episode. Let's go. 
Kevin, it's been a long time since we yes, haven't just jumped right into an episode, right. so we need to do an intro of some kind. We haven't done that for a while. So here's the question from Heidi. Heidi. Just discovered your podcast, Lifelong LCMS Lutheran. You asked for questions. We did. We did. I am curious about the doctrine of substitutionary atonement as I recently became aware that other Christians don't hold the same view of how the death of Christ works. Ooh. I put works in quotes because that's what yeah. she said. So that's her question. Substitutionary atonement. Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> that's actually a gigantic question and one that we're going to be very careful with how we answer. Not because we're scared of the answer, but because um, this is a situation, as it are many answers to many specific questions, and where if you say too much, you're wrong. And if you say too little, you can also be equally wrong. Mm-hmm. So um, we might need to qualify what we say. Just be aware of that, that this is not one of those, um, I can quote this verse where Paul says it's a substitutionary, substitutionary atonement, therefore we're done. Because substitutionary atonement is not a phrase that we derive from Scripture. Mm-hmm. This is something the church has used to describe the teaching of Scripture. Yeah. So this is one of those terms where you have to understand um, the term, why it's being used, and what is the scriptural impetus behind the, the use of the term. Well, and kind of my question to you when as we're prepping for this and getting ready was, hey, we just talked about Hebrews last week. Right. Or was it the week before? Uh, whenever we talked about Hebrews. But... Hey, it's you know, atonement is very much an Old Testament concept with the sacrifices, and so Hebrews is probably a great place to go for a substitutionary mm-hmm. atonement because it's all about Old Testament interpreted through the lens of Jesus, and mm-hmm. here's here's how you see this now. And you were like, No. <laughs> Wait, what? No. But it's, it's all about the atonement. I yeah, mean, and you would think that's where it is, but that's I mean, it is there and, and people get it there. As but a that's concept. Not, that's yeah. not really the place you would go. Um so we're going to look a little bit about the scriptural passages that people usually invoke when they talk about substitutionary atonement, um, usually meaning from what I've read and, and learned. The typical passages. Typical passages. Yeah. And then, but we also want to make, make sure we understand that this term is simply one of many ways to discuss what God did in the sending of his son yeah. and what Christ accomplished in his perfect life, in his death and his resurrection, on behalf of sinners, and and this gets into not only christological ideas, which is what we're discussing as Christology in this giant topic, but it also then turns to soteriology. Ooh, and salvation! Soteriology is the way the church talks about salvation. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about words like justification by grace through faith, something like that. Those are soteriology terms. Those are describing how sinners are saved by the work of God in Christ Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. By Jesus' death, by his resurrection, by his perfect life, all these kind of things. Um, so just uh, be aware of that. This is a term that that is not necessarily talking about the person and nature of Christ as one person with two natures, but this is actually talking about the effect of the work that he did as the Christ, mm-hmm. one person, two natures. Yeah. Okay, we talked a couple of times ago about one of the important things in the doctrine of Christology is that when we talk about Jesus as one person with two natures, we say everything he did in the state of humiliation, in the state of exaltation, everything he accomplished in the state of humiliation, he did in order to save us. Right. That's an important part of this whole discussion, right? Why do we care that Jesus is true God and true man and one person and two natures? Why? Because this is what, this is how God works salvation for sinners. Well, this this is part of, this is another question that I had in a, a discussion on another video, not one of ours, but on Matt Whitman, who we had on the mm-hmm. podcast a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Um, I guess we released it a couple weeks ago. Anyways, there's this discussion of whether or not Jesus is God. Mm-hmm. And that that question actually becomes critical to this right. very discussion here. So substitutionary atonement and soteriology or how, mm-hmm. how salvation works, how does mm-hmm. how does this happen? Jesus being God is actually a required component for us to be saved. Well, if, okay. Can I, can I phrase We're it that gonna, way? No, you can't. Please Ooh. don't. Uh-oh, See, this what did is, I do? Yeah. <laughs> mm. 
this is and this is kind of an issue for for us in our church body sometimes um we don't tell God what He must meet as a requirement. Oh, okay. We reflect what we learn from Scripture as the way He accomplished it. Okay. So I don't say to God, "Here's here's what you need to work out." Now we're going to assign to Jesus these qualities so that He can work it out. Gotcha. Right. So we say, "Well, He had to be true God so we can conquer sin, death, and the devil." Well, I know that's what the Catechism says, but we don't <laughs> want to understand it in that way. What we understand is. We see that his divine nature is the way that he overcame sin, death, and the power of the devil, because that's a thing that we would say that the divine nature does, right? So he says according to his divine nature. But we don't say, well, and I think we're going to require this of Jesus and therefore assign it to him, because in our vision of salvation, it has to happen that well, way. Well, and I think the reason we would assign that is because we know that without that divine nature... It can't happen. No, 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 no. Okay, that's where you're going to fire field. Uh, we know see, that I'm without still that divine. This. Yes, so we know <laughs> without the divine nature, it doesn't. It didn't happen. Didn't. We know uh, how it did happen. That's the point. Gotcha. See, we're not saying to God, "Here's the artificial criteria. Let's see if the New Testament fits into it." No, what we're saying is, this is what God did. So it's talking about it in terms of can or can't, and applying that to God. That's actually yeah, the problem. That's a major problem. This is the difference between. You try very hard to confessing not, what yes. scripture says, and I don't, what's shaping what, scriptures into what we require them to say. Okay, so that's a hard. This is this is distinction the to figure out, right? And this is why, and and, and no offense, that's why I'm saying no to some of the things. you're Yeah, saying, no, because, that's great <laughs> because we want to be careful that we're not standing above scripture and saying Jesus has to fit into this paradigm that I've set. Let's see if we can find passages where it fits. Yeah. No, what we want to do is say, this is the way Scripture presents it to us as God's word that we trust. And then do we believe that? And then we say, okay, it says he has a divine nature. It says he has a human nature. It says that he's one person. It says that he conquers sin, death, and devil. It says that he dies and he sheds his blood. How do we deal with all this? They say, oh, well, according to his divine nature, he conquers sin, death, and the devil. According to his human nature, he sends, he sheds his blood. We go, okay, that's a way for us to describe what, what Scripture teaches. We don't start and say, what we need is a God-man so we can deal with this, that, and the other thing. Okay. And say, okay, let's assign Scripture passages to that. No, we don't. We start with what Scripture actually gives to us as the action of God in Christ to save. And then we say, okay, how do we talk about this? How has the church historically described this? And vicarious atonement is actually one of those ways that we talk about what did Jesus do? Okay, it's interesting you phrase that in terms of church history because I think where I see this coming up in the wrong way is when you get the history channel uh-huh. telling you what Christian history is. Right. Where they say, well, at the Council of Nicaea, they had to say that Jesus was God, and mm-hmm. so here is the doctrine that they right. came up with and invented yep. Yep. at that point. Before that, nobody believed that Jesus was God, uh-huh. or any history channel is an easy target, but this right. happens Time all, all over the all place, over. Yeah, yeah, wherever it is, where it's, well, they had to say that because if they didn't say that, then this thing over here wouldn't be true. Mm-hmm. And that's what you're saying, Kevin, is we've actually, or what I've just done, is I've incorporated that same way of thinking into my own theology. Yeah. And how I do theology. Except for you're not denying the reality of Christianity. Um, well, yeah, uh, but the it's, the, it's the, a slippery slope that the leads process. to that. Yes. I'm saying the process, I, right. I've done the same thing. So we all do this. Yeah. We all say, I kind of got this conception in my mind. It hasn't worked this way. Therefore, I'll go find a scripture passage to, to, to back it up. That was really fast. <laughs> because that's how we do it. We do it really fast. Yeah. Instead of saying, this is what scripture says. How do I confess that? And and this is where we keep going back to the creeds. This is where we keep going back to our confessions. This is where we keep going back to the liturgy. This is where we keep going back to the language of the church to say, this is how the church reads all this text about Christ and says, one way to talk about this is vicarious atonement. One way to talk about this is justification by grace through faith. One way to talk about this is, right, and then you just fill mm-hmm. in the blank. Um, you keep saying vicarious atonement. Is substitutionary atonement oh, that Heidi wrote us? Is that different? It's the same thing. So vicarious okay, that's, I just, just want to means check. 
something that stands in the place of something else, same like a substitute. Okay. Okay. Um, so substitutory sharing atonement is the doctrine or this is the idea that Jesus, just to put it very crassly, Jesus took the place of sinners, received the wrath of God for the sin of the sinner. He stood in the, in the place of the sinner and took all that and then gives to sinners his righteousness. So he literally took the place of sinners on the cross. He mm-hmm. died the death that a sinner deserved, even though he didn't deserve it himself. I don't hear anything in that that sounds unbiblical. Right. So this all sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's why it's been confessed, because right. this is a way to talk about what Jesus did on the cross. And and we'll look in a second at, at the New Testament passages that, that lead us toward this kind of confession. Um, the problem is that there really isn't a scripture passage that says, you should talk about this as a vicarious atonement. Hmm. I mean, there are passages that use similar language, um, but they're translations. Is this like the same argument with like the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible, but the concept Similar, is? except for the, there, there are closer words to vicarious atonement or substitutionary atonement than there are Trinity. Ah. Trinity is entirely foreign to Scripture. Gotcha. That is just a word we've That word about. isn't even there, yeah. But some translations actually do have vicarious atonement at places. Okay. Um, so it's a little bit different. But... But the idea of a substitutionary atonement is the teaching that when Jesus died on the cross, he, as the perfect Lamb of God, the perfect Son of God, died where a sinner should have been. So he takes the place of a sinner. Hmm. He lays down his innocent life in the place of sinners. And that exchange then satisfies the wrath of God, satisfies the law, and the result is that, that God then is changed... Right. Is this what Luther called the great exchange or the happy exchange? One of the ways that, okay, now we're piling up metaphors. Right? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. So, so one of the ways Luther communicated this idea was with the, the glad exchange or the happy exchange where the, the innocent uh, takes on the sin of the sinner and gives to the sinner his righteousness. Okay. So Jesus takes our sins and gives us his righteousness. And the happy part is, we get the better end of the bargain. Mm, yeah. Right? We, Jesus takes away from us sin and death and hell and gives to us life and forgiveness in heaven. And we go, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's not really much else we can say to that, right? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, and that's the church's response throughout the ages is thanks. Mm-hmm. As Lutherans, we get really excited and sing this is the feast or something, you know. <laughs> Because that's what we do. But isn't um, that a recent innovation, though? It is kind of a recent yeah. thing. But I like it. I still like it. It's a neat yeah. little song. I like singing but, it. But the point is, this is actually the rhythm of the liturgy, is that God says, I will forgive your sins. I will take away your guilt and the punishment for your sins. I will put all that on my son. And the church says, wow, thanks. thanks. Yeah. yeah. That's great. I'm a poor, miserable sinner. I don't deserve that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. This is fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to praise you for that. Mm-hmm. Like, because, wow, thanks. What, what other response what else would could I, do? I have? Yeah. And then he goes, well, if you're asking what you should do, I've got some ideas. Yep. You can love me with your whole heart and love your, your neighbor, neighbor as, as yourself. yourself. Yeah, that's what you can do because I love you so much. And you go, well, what if I mess it up? And he goes, well, let's go back to premise number one. <laughs> I love you so much, I'm going to forgive all of your sins, right? Yeah. So we got that straight, right? So when you sin, I'll forgive you every single time. So what do you do in response? I say thanks. Yes, and I love God with a whole heart and I love my neighbor. Myself. Yeah. Okay, good. What if I mess that up? Okay, let's return. <laughs> let's go back. You know, and this I'm is sensing and then a this, pattern yes. here, Kevin. Yes. So this is the rhythm not only of our worship, but also of our life. Yeah. Where we every time the law reminds us of our sinfulness and condemns us legitimately condemns us, condemns us for our sin, we run to the rescue. Mm-hmm. We run to Jesus. And we think Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. Therefore, it is no longer I who live, but but Christ in me. But the life I do live in the body. Nobody ever memorizes that second half, yeah, Kevin. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what happens is is that I have been killed with Christ. And that's, that's actually really good news because I mm-hmm. needed to die. My sin needed to be killed. Otherwise, there's an eternal punishment for it. Yeah. And now the life that I live in the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of my baptism, 
I don't just live as a sinner who has nothing. I actually live it in Christ. I live it in his perfect life, right? Because because Jesus was perfectly obedient. Mm-hmm. It's not just that he he like hung out and avoided sin for 30 years and then died. <laughs> Whew, dodge no, that he, bullet. Whoo, I just avoid temptation. <laughs> um, no, he actually lived a perfect life in both avoiding sin, but also doing good things. Doing the good he was supposed to do. Right, so yeah. fulfilling the law. And what that means is, is the vicarious or substitutionary atonement, the result of that is that he took on my sin, but he also gives to me this perfect life in which I am now welcomed to live. Mm-hmm. And Ephesians 2.10 says this, right? Creating Christ Jesus to do the good works. That have been prepared for you beforehand. That have been prepared beforehand. Yeah. Well, when were they prepared? In Christ, right? It's all mm-hmm. in Christ. And so you go, oh. So, so this really then gets to the idea of substitutionary atonement as a way to talk about what was that that happened on the cross, Okay, the New Testament is is not unclear on the cross being the thing that matters. Right. I mean, this is obvious. <laughs> it's the death of Christ, and then obviously three days later, his resurrection. That's the thing, right? His so, per, his incarnation, yeah. his perfect life. It was all leading up to this, and this is the climactic moment of our salvation. And so we have we have Paul saying we preach Christ and him crucified, right? I deliver to you things of first importance that Christ was crucified for us and was raised from the dead. You know, that that um in John, when when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw him into myself. It's all it's all getting us to the cross. The cross mm-hmm. is the thing. And obviously with the cross is always the resurrection. Right. That's the thing. So vicarious or substitution atonement is a way to talk about that. What happened on the cross? Well, it's actually quite simple. And so you got your finger in your Bible. Let's open it's that up. Down, Hubbard. Oh, uh, I'll just, I'll, I can fix that. Watch this. So, surely, He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities, and upon Him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That sounds like substitutionary atonement. It sounds a lot like substitutionary atonement. That's and, Isaiah, right? And that was written, you know, 700 years before Jesus died on the cross <laughs> in Isaiah. That's Isaiah 53. And so this is the prophecy of a suffering servant that will suffer in order to redeem God's people, in order to buy them back, in order to return them from their captivity in Babylon, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what the suffering servant will do to rescue God's people. And what happens is when Jesus comes and does this, we learn that he's rescuing us not just from an exile to a foreign nation, he's rescuing us from our sin, from our imprisonment to sin. So we, you've talked about the substitutionary part. I mean, that's that's pretty obvious how that happens. Mm-hmm. Define atonement well, for us. Well, this is the funny thing. Really atonement is a word that doesn't have any meaning. Oh, great. It's a, it's a <laughs> word that was actually made up, right, in one of the earliest English well, translations Kevin, all words of the Bible. Are actually made up. Well, they're all made up. So, but this one was made up simply in order to translate the Bible. Oh, really? This, the English version the of English it? The English word atonement is not really a word. It was made up. Oh, to translate the Bible. Is this why we don't use it in common English? Yeah, it's like not, a, it's not ex- really a word that's a, Everyday English. conversation, it doesn't really show up? It actually is the slamming together of three words. Well, two words with a syllable. At one, mint. And mint is not something you eat because you have bad breath. Yeah. At one mint, meaning making something one that was not one before. Hmm. That's actually what atonement means. It's, it's one of those weird words that actually means it's three components. Interesting. At one mint. Meant. You can look it up. The etymology is crazy. It's like it's just <laughs> slamming words together to make a new word. And is, is this why one of the reasons there's so much debate over this right concept? If, yeah, you, if we can concept, call it that, it's, it, because you're not going to read back in the church fathers and find the word atonement because it doesn't exist. Gotcha. So well, what none of them were written is, in English, so that's part of it too. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. So what happens is then the, it finds its way in, into English translation of the Bible reflecting back to that translation. Uh, and um, so that's where this whole thing gets a little weird. And it's not really my fault. I can't take credit for this. Oh, we're going to blame you anyways. You might as well. Because it's got to have somebody to blame. Um, 
So, like in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says, He is the propitiation for our sins. Well, some people translate that word propitiation, which is a big sacrifice word, right? Mm-hmm. So, we have propitiation and expiation, which I think we actually covered at one point on this podcast a very I long think time we ago. did. That sounds familiar, yes. but it's been a while. Those are two sacrifice words. And so, some people actually translate that word as vicarious atonement or substitutionary atonement. If we didn't cover that, listeners, go back and listen and let us know, and we'll cover yeah, it in yeah, a future Yeah, listen to one. all of our podcasts and right, support was, us to was, move forward that to was the point. cover it Yeah, if we didn't. That's what I was saying, Kevin. Yes. Yeah. I was reiterating. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's much like someone will say, I think the Bible says. I shouldn't make that voice because a lot of people say it to me that are very intelligent. I, that's my <laughs> that's actually my voice for when I'm being stupid in my own head, not someone else. Gotcha. So I don't want to offend anybody. That's okay, actually Okay, that's a stupid Kevin that's voice. That's a stupid Kevin voice, yeah. yeah. But um, when someone says, I think the Bible says somewhere, I often say, well, I don't know. Why don't you read it? Let's, let's, let's read find the whole it. thing. Let's find it. Yep. Yeah, I'm just waiting for someone to take the challenge up. <laughs> I often ask people to, to find things. I'm like, where in the New Testament does it say? And people look at me. I'm like, hmm, go read it. <laughs> go read it. Come back and tell me. I'm encouraging you to read right, the Bible. I'm actually encouraging you to read the yeah. entire New Testament and tell me if I'm wrong or right. <laughs> yeah, and people kind of look at me like, I don't know. So, That's too much work to prove you wrong. That's a Kevin. lot of work. Yeah. Well, or, or to prove God's word to be true. Well, it's not too nice. much work for that. Um, so, so getting back to the back question, to the Bible. The the point is, um, this this whole idea of substitutionary atonement or vicarious atonement. It's simply a way for us to confess what the New Testament teaches and what the Old Testament teaches, as we just read in Isaiah. Mm-hmm. Is that when Jesus died on the cross, he took sinners' place. Mm-hmm. He took the sinners' place. So, if you look at uh, one of the most obvious places that most people run to is Second Corinthians chapter five. Um, which, by the way, if you're looking for a devotional passage or something to memorize, just memorize Second Corinthians chapter five. It's just fantastic, and you know a lot of it already. But Second Corinthians chapter five verse twenty one says, "For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin." so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There it is, right? Yeah. Jesus, who knew no sin, God made him sin. So that the result of that is, in Christ, we who are sinners might become the righteousness of God. Mm-hmm. That's kind of, that's it right there, summed up, Yeah. right? That's it. So then another place you want to look is Galatians, which is conveniently the next book. Chapter 3. And it's hard to find. There isn't necessarily just one, um, one verse. I mean, this verse thirteen sums it up. But you got to read this whole argument of chapter three to kind of get it. But this is the way verse thirteen sums it up. It says, "Christ redeem us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us." It's substitution. That's the substitution part. Yeah. Okay. So. Christ actually becomes the curse that we deserve for our breaking of the law. And the atonement part is his death. Okay, so the atonement is sacrificial language where it's the shedding of blood, it's the sacrifice, and that's what you're getting to earlier with the allusion to Hebrews where it talks about the right. Old Testament sacrificial system. Because when I think atonement, I think the blood sacrifices right. and that's like, exactly. oh, that's atonement, okay. Because it's a sacrifice word, right? Yeah. And that's exactly the point. Is these So now we're kind of bringing together these, these concepts. One is a substitutionary or vicarious idea, which is he became a curse for us or he, he became sin for us. And the other is the sacrificial language of atonement, um, paying the price for propitiation, expiation, right? Is that the wrath of God, the law of God is satisfied through a blood offering, through a sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And then now all of a sudden you say it that way. You're like, oh, that's a whole Old Testament thing where, you know, you had to kill bulls or goats or whatever. And God would forgive sins through that. And then Jesus comes and through his perfect life and his death and his resurrection, he fulfills that, that entire sacrificial system, mm-hmm. right? So that's the atonement part. He is presenting the blood sacrifice before God of himself, right? So then you hear you hear John the Baptist in John one twenty nine saying, Behold the Lamb of, Lamb God, of God who, who takes, takes away the away sin. The the sin of, and you go, how is he going to do that? And so he turns water into wine. You're like, that's impressive. Is that <laughs> taking away sin? And he's like, 
my hour has not yet come. Yeah. And then he goes and he turns over ta- and he cleans out the temple and you're like, okay, but still not thinking that's forgiveness of sins. He's like, no, but I am the temple. So, you know, this is where the sacrifice is going to occur. Right. Mm-hmm. And then he, he kind of talks to Nicodemus and he talks to a woman at the well and he heals a nobleman's son and he heals an invalid and he feeds 5,000 and he walks in the water and, you know, I am the bread of life and all this kind of stuff. And still none of these heals are the blind sins. man. He heals, you know, yeah. and then he raises Lazarus from the dead. We're like, wow, that is all quite amazing. And he goes, but that's not it yet. That's still not the point. <laughs> and then the rest of the gospel from chapter 12 on is a story of the atonement. Hmm. It's the passion narrative. It's getting him to the cross where he will actually shed his blood as the sacrifice, right? And every gospel does that, where the major, right. like the largest section, is the, the is, passion narrative. Yeah. So, so the entire New Testament presents okay. Jesus' death on the cross as the fulfillment of the entire sacrifice system, as the one blood that satisfies God's wrath. That that. You know, really, we, we say it this way, because of the sacrifice of Christ, God is changed so that he is now favorably disposed towards sinners. Okay. So um, the favor of God. God doesn't change, and you just said God is changed. Isn't this I'm fun? confused now. Isn't that great? <laughs> the unchangeable God is changed. Now, remember, this is from eternity, and this is in eternity. So that the death and resurrection of Christ is what accomplishes, in the New Testament narrative, it's what accomplishes this salvation for sinners, which saves sinners of all time. Mm-hmm. So, and people always ask this question, but it's it's very simple if you think of it this way, is that Adam was saved through the death and resurrection of Christ. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that... At Adam's point in history, it was a promise that, that from happen. his point of view, hadn't been fulfilled yet. Sure. But remember, when God's promise is made, it is kept in Christ. Mm-hmm. All the promises All his of God, promises are yes in Christ. No matter what they are, they're yes yeah. in Christ. So when, when God promised to Adam that I will send the seed of the woman to crush the serpent's head, it was done. It was done at the cross, and Adam was saved because of that. And that's the way it is for us, too. The promises of God are kept in Christ. Where? It's the substitutionary atonement. That's one of the ways to talk about it. Is this where we also, another verse we could bring in was Christ crucified before the foundation of the world? Or how yes. that one's... Right. I think that's the right phrasing yeah. of it. Yeah, that's one way to talk about it. Yeah. Um, or Ephesians in that we were we were predestined before the world began to be in Christ, in him. Hmm. So, so all this language draws us to understand that this is... The sacrificial system was a prophecy of this event. Right, it was all leading up to Christ as the sacrifice for sin, Mm -hmm. so that the blood that forgave sins in the Old Testament, the power in that forgiveness was actually the blood of Christ. So this leads us another verse we need to read before we forget to, which keep going in Galatians. We are in chapter three. Go to Galatians four, which is very important at this time of year for us. Galatians four four and five says this, but when the fullness of time had come. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So this is another way to describe what Christ did. See, now we have a different metaphor coming in, right? Yeah, now it's now we have, redemption and adoption. Right, redemption and adoption. Yeah. Redemption is the buying back of a slave, or the paying for a slave, right? So mm-hmm. if you redeem something, you pay for it. So now this is another way to talk about the death and resurrection of Christ is that it redeems us, right? It pays for our sins. It buys us back from slavery. So you think of John 8, right? If, if anyone's sinning, he's a slave to sin. But if the son says you free... You are free indeed. See, we all know that part. Yeah. Because that's, <laughs> that's redemption language. Yeah. That's setting free language. Well, what was the price that was paid to set us free from our slavery? It's the death and resurrection of Christ. It's his perfect life, perfect death, right? His, and his blood shed. His blood shed is that sacrificial price. Mm-hmm. So these are all the ways we talk about it. Um, you think of Mark ten forty five, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We all know what a ransom is, right? It's my middle name. 
Exactly. Yeah. It's also what you pay for to get someone. Oh, yes. If somebody's right. been kidnapped. Exactly. Yeah. I, I suppose so, it's not actually about me. Sorry. It's, it's about other people. Peter thinks it's all about him. So does Kevin. But Kevin is, oh, <laughs> equally wrong. <laughs> yep. So... <laughs> So that's the point. Because I am uh, born with concupiscence. concupiscence, because I do believe that it's all about me, because because my God is myself and my idols need to be killed. Did we just say concupiscence at the exact, at same, the exact time? same time? At the exact same time, which <laughs> I might have to quit now. Um, but but really, be, because of this, because of my sin problem, because of my concupiscence, my inbred love of sinning, and, and even worse than that, my inbred love of self, mm-hmm. that I truly believe that I'm God and God has to deal with it, because of that wretchedness in me. I need a savior. You do need a substitute. I need a substitute. Because what we have inside us isn't going to save us. And I can never be good. Yeah. And I can never accomplish this. I can't fix it. I can't even improve it. Right. I need <laughs> I need perfection to fix my imperfection. Hmm. I need it to take my place. And what I really need is for him to give me what I can't get. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what he does on the cross. He takes my sins. He takes your sins. And he crucifies them. He nails them to the cross. And the wrath of God is poured out on those sins in Christ. Mm -hmm. And then as a result, he gives to us freely by his grace, forgiveness, life, and salvation. All right. So I have two questions as we close here because we're starting to wrap up. The first is, we probably handle this one quickly, I hope. But you, I have heard, especially Internet History Channel, this is a new concept. The church invented it. Mm -hmm. recently like Mm -hmm. in the last few hundred years before they talked about salvation differently they invented different ways of talking about it this is a new invention Mm -hmm. i don't know if heidi has heard this and this is part of her question but i know in my own interactions online and in the world you kind of see this from academics we'll say well yeah this this is a new concept that the church has invented this has not been taught until recently right what what do we do with that well again we we simply look back at scripture and say, is this an accurate way to talk about what scripture teaches? And as we, sh- we showed very quickly, and there's plenty more passages to read, this is simply a, a very acceptable way to talk about what scripture teaches. Now, in the history of the church, you're going to find certain ways to talk about scriptural passages and certain doctrines even waxing and waning in the history of church based on what's going on in the church, based on what the, the popular philosophy of the day is. And, and what, this what is, they're reacting right, to, what, are they reacting what they're to, fighting against. What are people thinking? Mm-hmm. How are people talking? So sure, the, like like you said in one of my earlier comments, it wasn't written in English, dude. So <laughs> so language also shapes how you talk about things. Yeah. And like we said, at, atonement is actually kind of a made-up word. So, so and in this case, the fact that it's new simply reflects that, well, English is also new in the history right. of doing but theology. But what, what isn't new is a theology that this is teaching. Correct. Not yeah. new at all. The terminology might be. Right. That we're using it in this, this these particular words, but that doesn't mean the concept itself is right. And I think and, that's where wires get crossed. And this is the the issue with the whole History Channel, as they say, well, you know, the Church at Nicaea finally said these words, and we're like, yeah, that's when he wrote the Creed. You're right. <laughs> and they say, and therefore they invented the doctrine, and we go, whoa, no, we're simply <laughs> confessing what has always been true. Mm-hmm. Just because we finally figured out the right way we want to say it doesn't mean we're making up the truth behind the words. And that's why you got to be careful with is, is the church might struggle with, with decades on how to say something just because we finally come up with the words doesn't mean that the doctrine was invented at that time. No, the doctrine is eternal. Yeah. These truths we're talking about are true before the world began. Just because we finally attach certain words to it doesn't mean the truth was invented at that moment. It simply means that we're now using those words to describe this eternal truth. Or that we even discovered it at that moment. Yeah, we didn't yeah. discover anything. It's it's just like, okay, I've been struggling how to say this. Well, this guy kind of said that. That works. Hey, I like that And way. then someone says, so when you say that, do you mean this? And you go, no, no, no. When I say that, I mean this. And that's the development of creeds and confessions, mm-hmm. right? We say, well, we believe there's a God. And you go, okay, I think that means there's 32 million gods you can choose which one. Is one of them want. Zeus? Right. And we go, no. When we mean God, we mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit God, like the one found in the Old and New Testament of the, of the scriptures. And they go, oh, okay, so what you mean is there's three gods. And they go, no, <laughs> oh, no, 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 wait, stop, no. stop, 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 stop. 
right? And so that's what's happening is we're not inventing God. Yeah. We're simply helping people understand that we are confessing the, the truths of Scripture, and, and we are doing our best to communicate those truths so that every understands that the truth of Scripture actually impacts sinners in this m- mode in which God saves sinners in Christ. All right, last thing for Heidi, our lifelong LCMS Lutheran. She's going to go to church this Sunday. Yeah, please do. Where is she going to see this Sunday morning? Because I think it. this is what we confess, and I think she'll see this confessed Sunday morning. And hopefully anybody who's listening is attending a church that also right. confesses this. I know if you're going so, to a faithful LCMS church, you're going to hear it. This is the whole point of the liturgy. You're going to hear this in every aspect of the liturgy. Um, you're going to hear it in the absolution when the, when the pastor actually stands vicariously. <laughs> this is really Ooh. fun. He's going to stand in the stead and by the command. That means he's vicariously a substitute for Jesus himself, and he's pronouncing Jesus' words on you. And the forgiveness you receive is the forgiveness that Christ won through his death and resurrection. That's vicarious. It's also atonement. You're going to see it, in, you're going to hear it in the readings. You're going to sing it in the hymns. You're going to see it in the Lord's Supper. When the pastor says, Are you going to taste it? This is my body given for you. For you. Those, yeah. those for you words, right? Yeah. There it is. That's the substitutionary. There it is. Yeah. And, you, and, you, and you eat it and you drink it. And you trust it. You you mm-hmm. believe it. Yeah. That this is Christ for you. This is God for you. This is a sinner who walked up, let's be honest, not worthy to come to the altar. Yeah, none of us. I am not worthy nope. to come to the altar. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you read through it, you're like, dude, I am out. I am not worthy. And yet we have a God who invites us to come. Mm-hmm. And he says, for you. Because he's going to substitute that. Yes. Yeah. My son is going to forgive your sins. He took your place on the cross. He forgives your sins. He gives you his righteousness and mm-hmm. out the very body and blood of Christ for you. Yeah. See that? There it is. And then you walk out and you're just so overjoyed that as a good Lutheran, you say, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Heidi, for sending in a great question yeah. that really helps us focus on what the crucial conversation is. And like we said last week, it's it's all about Jesus. So thank you for helping us focus on that, and we'll see you guys next time. See ya.